Back in the second part of the course, uh, focused on moral theories, we looked at our good dead friend, John Stuart Mill, who advanced uh, utilitarianism. The idea is that for John Stuart Mill, the action that it is correct to do is the one that creates the greatest happiness uh, for those who matter morally, and of course, the least amount of unhappiness for those who matter morally. Now, John Stuart Mill, when he discussed the scope of morality, that is to say, who counts morally, he was willing in a somewhat un unusual move uh, to extend that to all of humanity and the unusual part is he's willing to extend it to all of sentient creation, creatures that can feel pleasure and pain. And not surprisingly, uh, many uh, people, philosophers and non-philosophers, who want to argue for uh, treating animals uh, better, treating them well, often embrace utilitarian arguments, either consciously and academically, you know, where they explicitly argue in a utilitarian theory, or kind of informally where they're adopting utilitarianism, perhaps not being aware of the theory. So utilitarian arguments are commonly used to argue in favor of better treatment of animals. It, they could also be used for plants as well or any creatures. They can also be used to argue against such better treatment because as we saw with utilitarianism, uh, it can be used in a variety of ways. And many of the kind of uh, stock objections or critiques of utilitarianism, many of the examples involve presenting a case which seems to maximize utility, uh, but seems, you know, something horrible. So anytime one is arguing you know, utilitarian uh, theory, one is of course generally assuming that this theory is the correct moral theory, which is obviously subject to debate. Now for the utilitarian, as we saw back in part two, uh, generically speaking, an action is right if it creates more utility value for the morally relevant beings than disutility, which would be negative value. And so a key part of this debate among utilitarians is the moral status of animals and other creatures. Are animals morally relevant or not? And one could be utilitarian and believe that animals have no moral relevance. They don't count. That's certainly possible. So if animals are not morally relevant, they don't matter, then their treatment in general would not be very morally significant. Unless, of course, one argued that, as Kant did in a non-utilitarian way, that how we treated animals may not be relevant to the animals in terms of the, their ethical status, which they would lack, that it would be... Uh, consequences for, for others. Uh, as a concrete example, a person could say that animals themselves have no moral status, but harming someone's you know beloved dog would of course harm that person. And so they, they could argue that although dogs themselves are entitled to no more moral relevance, people are, so we should be kind to pets, for example. Now, if animals are morally relevant on their own, that's to say they, they count in the utilitarian calculation, then their treatment would obviously be relevant to the moral assessment of actions because they would count in the calculation. Now, it is also, of course, possible to argue that animals are morally relevant in varying degrees. It doesn't have to be, you know, either or. So if someone accepts that animals are morally relevant, they count in the calculation, you can have different, you know, amounts of weight assigned to different creatures. So a person could be utilitarian, they could say, yes, animals count, but they might hold the view that animals count less than humans. And that's a fairly common view. So a person could be utilitarian and say, you know, we should consider animals, you know, their suffering and well-being. But they might argue that if you had, say, a lifeboat scenario where you had to choose between, uh, you know, bringing a human on a lifeboat on a sinking ship or saving a dog, even though, of course, the humans and dogs would, would suffer, you know, terribly if they were dying by drowning or being, you know, attacked, killed by sharks or some some other, you know, ocean predators. But they would argue that humans have, say, a, a higher status because perhaps they can, they have higher faculties and can suffer more, perhaps. And so on those views, animals would count, but would count less typically than humans. Now, of course, utilitarians could also have cases where some humans count less than others. So if a human was presumably this is 
a critique that's sometimes advanced. If, so if a human uh, was less capable of suffering than another human, then they would matter more and should perhaps get a, or, you know, if someone's more capable of suffering more, they should get the, the place on the lifeboat. Whereas the human who would suffer less should be, you know, should go in the water, I guess, with the dogs. But anyways, utilitarianism is complicated. So the standard way utilitarians argue for animals being morally relevant, and this is not universal. You know, every utilitarian philosopher seems to differ from the others, but here's a common way. And many utilitarians, such as John Stuart Mill, argue that pleasure is a positive value. Uh, they call this, you know, utility, and pain is of negative value, disutility. Or you can go very generically with, you know, happiness, unhappiness. And as Mill kind of argued, since animals feel pleasure and pain, they would play a role in the calculation of utility and hence would be relevant beings. And Mill, as I noted earlier, explicitly includes sentient beings within his scope of morality. Other utilitarians, of course, can have very differing views. So to do a argument either you know in favor of animals or sort of kind of against animals on utilitarian grounds, here's a you know a basic template. So the first step would be to uh, look at the utility generated by the practice, the positive value, assess that, basically lay out the the pluses and perhaps you know assign some informal weight to them. The second step of course is looking at the disutility, the harms generated by the practice. And again the utility and disutility would be relative to the beings that matter, the beings that, that count. And of course, in the standard calculation, if the disutility outweighs the utility, the action would of course be morally wrong. And if the utility outweighs the disutility, then the action would be morally acceptable. Uh, two examples. Uh, they'll, they'll be, as you might imagine, somewhat unpleasant. So if you're uh, sensitive about what you eat, uh, or uh, you really care about animals, you might want, want to stop listening at this point. It's not going to be like obviously too terrible, but it could be somewhat upsetting. So first example, veal. As I mentioned, if you've taken this class uh, in person, as I mentioned in class in person, my favorite uh, thing to eat uh, before my 18th birthday was veal. And every birthday up until my 18th birthday, I had veal parmesan. But then I had the misfortune of taking a philosophy class, introduction to uh, to philosophy and read a book called Animal Liberation by Peter Singer and I learned about the truth behind veal. And objectively speaking, the veal are uh, young cows, calves that are, that are raised in such a way they're fed like a, well, it was really awful, maybe better now, maybe not. Uh, but I remember reading through the book and to show pictures of, of calves in these tiny stalls because if they were able to move around and exercise, it would you know change the texture of the meat. And veal is basically baby baby cow meat. And apparently, according to the book, they were force fed you know liquid a liquid diet, which was awful for them because you know imagine what like a anyone on a continuous liquid di diet uh, how that would affect their gastrointestinal tract, and so. According to this book, the calves were suffering horribly. And as soon as I learned that, um, I, you know, was reading the, the book uh, and learned about utilitarianism. And I kind of thought, well, I really, really enjoy eating veal, but my enjoyment is vastly outweighed by the suffering of this this calf. Because, yeah, veal is, is delicious. Uh, I still, I can still remember what it tastes like and I still get cravings for it. Uh, but I haven't had it since then because of that that damn book. And so from a utilitarian standpoint, you would look at the suffering of the veal calf, and on one assessment, the suffering of the calf would far away uh, the enjoyment of humans. Therefore, veal would be, on this view, morally wrong. Now, of course, you could do an alternative assessment. Uh, one could argue that the enjoyment humans experience from eating veal outweighs the suffering of the calves, or one, of course, could argue that, you know, another counter would argue that cows just don't don't count, in which case their suffering would be irrelevant. Or they count less, in which case their suffering would be relevant, but wouldn't offset uh, the human enjoyment from consuming them. Now, an example of arguing kind of against animals 
would be on utilitarian grounds would be medical testing. So, as you perhaps know, they test um, you know new drugs, etc. Often have to go through animal trials to, before they're used on humans to see what effects they have, and they move on to human trials and then, then eventually get out. And if they pass all these tests, they eventually get out into the population. And so, one could look at the on the positive side, testing new pharmaceuticals on animals, it allows the development of you know new pharmaceuticals, and also it allows um, us to you know catch potentially dangerous and harmful side effects or find that the medication is not very effective before we've used it on on humans. And this, of course, he assumes that you know humans out outweigh animals or that the benefits would be far greater. So one could argue, if you think that say animals have moral status and the suffering of say the lab rats used to develop a new cancer treatment is is relevant you could make the case well it is true the rats indeed do suffer through being given cancer and being tested and being injected with these chemicals and etc whatever is being done to them and you could say it's this is awful this is a huge negative a huge you know this is a lot of pain and suffering but then you could argue this would be offset by all the people saved from, say, the suffering from, you know, cancer, saving their lives, saving them from pain. And so you could allow animals to have meaningful moral status, but say that these benefits in the case of medical you know, testing uh, outweigh the suffering. And you could acknowledge that the suffering is terrible. It would be better if we didn't have to do this, but it is justified by the, the gain. And that'd be a pretty standard utilitarian argument in favor of, say, animal testing. And again, you can have the usual battles about do animals really have moral status or not on utilitarian grounds. So that's the super quick version of utilitarian arguments uh, for uh, animal rights um, or treating animals well, and of course, against treating animals well.